Hello everyone. We are going to get started. So first I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be doing a webinar on precise measurement of super smooth polished surfaces and also including a case study on a real world example of these types of samples. Uh, so I know a lot of you probably tuned in because Steve Munsey was going to be presenting. Unfortunately, he uh, had something come up last minute, so he needed me to fill in for him. Uh, so even though he prepared all this for today, I'm going to try to do it justice. Uh, so just to let you guys know, I do expect this presentation to last for about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, so for the presenters for today, uh, so as I was saying, my name is Mackenzie Massey. I'm an applications engineer at Zygo, and I am based out of our Santa Clara, California office. Joining me are my two coworkers, Rich Poltar and Dan Rusano, who are also applications engineers uh, here at Zygo. So they are based out of our headquarters in Connecticut. Uh, they'll be monitoring any questions that you submit throughout the webinar. And uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, we'll answer some of those questions live. If we don't get to your question live, then we'll make sure to follow up with you after the webinar. So we are all part of the applications team at Zygo, and we are effectively the metrology experts for you guys. So we're here as a resource, uh, whether it be questions on how to use your instrument, uh, do some analysis within the software, or help you try to figure out some issue that you guys are having with your own uh, process. So just a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Uh, so this is the GoToWebinar interface and there's options to adjust the relative size between the webcam and the presentation view. Um, there's also a control panel uh, that you can open up with a little orange box with the white arrow. And most importantly within that is the area where you can submit your questions. until the end. Uh, so now an overview of what we're going to get into today. So a customer came to us with a production, with some production challenges that they were have, particularly uh, with some sub-angstrom laser optic surfaces. We're going to talk about uh, the system we use and the technology to uh, help them with this issue. Then we're going to get into some results of that um, case study, and then talk about the final turnkey application that we made for them. Uh, then we'll get into some conclusions with uh, our recommendations and finally uh, finishing off with that Q&A session. So now let's get into what the actual problem was that they were facing. So all of a sudden, uh, they noticed that um, a bunch of their fully assembled mirror lasers uh, were having uh, power output issues. Uh, where they weren't uh, outputting as much power as they would expect. Uh, so uh, this was traced back down to the resonator mirrors within the assembly and potentially some issues going on with the surfaces of those mirrors. Uh, particularly uh, the surface finish of those mirrors um, and potentially any defects that were cause or causing scattering, uh, which was leading to that loss in output. So some of the potential failure mechanisms that uh, could be the cause of these issues are one, the substrate roughness of the mirror uh, that was then bleeding through into the final surface and causing that scatter, uh, though it also could have been the coating roughness itself, uh, as well as a defect or defects in the coating or contamination on the coated surfaces too. So there are some significant challenges when it comes to measuring these types of surfaces. So first off, they are extremely smooth. So the expectation is that they have a roughness on the order of an angstrom and a half or better. Uh, so when it comes to these types of surfaces, conventional measurement techniques just don't work uh, as they don't have the precision or information uh, in the final measurements to really get the information you need. So also not only are there challenges with just being able to diagnose the problem, but the customer also needed to take this 
uh, um, system and then input it into a production environment where there is uh, necessary for high speed for throughput requirements, as well as a simple interface for basic operators to be able to use. Now let's talk about exactly what we use to uh, diagnose this problem. So we start out using the Zygo NuV9000 3D Optical Surface Profiler uh, with the Smart PSI technology built into it. So Smart PSI enables us to measure highly sensitive um, take highly sensitive measurements uh, rapidly. So we can easily get down to less than an angstrom for uh, surface roughness. So SMART PSI uh, is a combination of our coherence scanning interferometry as well as phase shifting interferometry. And there are some key benefits to why you would want to use it. Uh, so it's non-contact, so there's no way of uh, causing any damage to the surface. It's fast, you can pretty much take measurements in less than a few seconds. It's simple and easy to use and easily automated, as well as it's magnification independent. So to step back for a moment, most people know our 3D optical profilers as being CSI based, or coherent scanning interferometers. So what exactly is it and how does it work? Uh, so CSI uses a broadband white light spectrum uh, illumination source and this allows us to uh, localize the interference at the zero optical path difference between the reference leg and the uh, part that you're trying to measure. So since we have a localized interference pattern and not a uh, interference pattern over the entire surface like you might get with a monochromatic source, this allows us to easily measure either very rough surfaces or step surfaces uh, quickly, simply, and uh, with high precision. So when we take a measurement, we're going to scan vertically through focus and we're gonna track in the interference pattern pixel by pixel. So we can see kind of in the course of a measurement what the camera is going to see. Uh, for example, signal A and signal B are what two pixels would see if they were step separated by a step. We then take this information and then transform it into a 3D topography map across uh, the entire sensor. So when we talk about PSI measurements or phase shifting interferometry, a lot of people are familiar with that um, being the main technology of our laser interferometers. So PSI requ acquires a, a sequence of images with a precisely controlled phase change, which is done through uh, rapidly oscillating a piezo. And as we do this, we collect that interference pattern and then transform that into the surface. And some of the key benefits of PSI is it's inherently going to be a low noise measurement. So when you're trying to get to sub angstrom type measurements, it makes it a lot easier to be able to uh, get that type of precision that you need. So smart PSI uh, takes the best of both of those, the robustness of CSI, and then combines it with the low noise of a phase shifting measurement and combines it into one final measurement technique. So it is ideal for super smooth optical type surfaces or shallow steps, uh, particularly for like these laser optic surfaces that we're going to be talking about today. So there are con some considerations when implementing smart PSI. Uh, and particularly, it comes down to noise. So we're doing this to try to uh, get as most precise or the most precision as we can to really be able to measure those sub angstrom type surfaces. So in any measurement system, there's going to be some inherent noise. Uh, that's not much that you can uh, do to remove. Uh, there's also some random error that just comes from some environmental factors like instability in the temperature of the local environment, some acoustical noise, or potentially air currents as well. And then there's also systematic error that comes from the optical system, uh, as well as the reference mirror within each of the objectives. So first let's talk about dealing with some of the random noise, whether it be inherent to the system or the local environment. So first you wanna minimize the source of the, uh, the randomized noise. So whether that be ensuring that the temperature of the environment is stable, minimizing any airflow or turbulence in the environment, as well as minimizing any kind of vibrations that might be coming from other instrumentation or uh, tools in the environment. So after we minimize the source of it, then we can work on the measurement side to minimize the effects of what residual noise is left. 
and we can do this through averaging. So averaging is going to take several measurements in a row and then combine those into one final measurement. So on the left-hand side, uh, we can see a measurement without any averaging applied, and there's kind of a graininess to it. Versus if we take 16 measurements and average them together, uh, which is the map on the final or on the right-hand side, you can see a lot of that graininess is gone, and we're really starting to look at the structure of the surface. So let's talk about dealing with systematic error, which generally shows up as a constant curvature or features uh, repeatedly showing up in the same location of each measurement. So typically this curvature or feature sizes are on the order of about one to 10 nanometers. And we can easily remove this by creating a 3D reference calibration using a silicon carbide reference flat, which has a roughness of about three angstroms. Uh, however, you can use any sample that's significantly smooth and flat enough. Uh, so less than three angstroms generally is something that would be pretty good to use for a, a system reference file. So for these measurements in our technology, we're using interferometric objectives, which have a little reference mirror built into them. And when we're measuring super polished surfaces like these laser optics, the roughness of that mirror actually starts to become a factor in the measurements as well. So when we go to create that 3D reference file, we can actually use the sample, the final sample that we need to measure as our calibration standard. So we can take multiple measurements across that and then average them into one final measurement. And we can use the automation routines within MX to help us make these uh, calibration files. So we can set up a pattern where it goes and measures, for instance, 16 measurements, and then we can average all of those into one final uh, system reference file or a 3D calibration, and then subtract it out. So when we average these measurements together, it's going to cancel out any effects coming from the surface that we're calibrating with, and then the remaining surface map is going to be a, a quantified measurement of the systematic error as well as the uh, surface roughness of the th reference in the objective. So now let's get into the actual case study itself. So we were provided with four sets of samples. Two of the samples came from the original vendor and then two were from a prospective vendor. So for vendor A uh, in sample one, it failed the roughness QC uh, as well as the laser power output check. Uh, but it did pass a visual inspection. When we look at sample two and three, which came from a prospective vendor, uh, for sample two, it did pass the both quality checks, whether it be the roughness or visual, as well as passing the power output. Sample three passed the roughness spec, but it failed the visual QC. Uh, so there were potentially some other issues going on with that one. And finally, sample four, it did pass uh, both the roughness QC, visual QC, and the laser output. So as we went through and measured these, we took 16 measurements across each part to get a sampling of the surface as it may vary across, uh, across the sample. And then we looked at the average SA of all of these measurements from within a part to get an idea as to the quality of the parts. So let's talk about the SA result for a minute. So a lot of people are probably pretty familiar with RA, which is the average roughness that you acquire from a single line profile from say like a contact stylus. SA is very similar in that it's the average roughness, but now we're gonna calculate it over an area rather than just a single line, which has some key benefits to it. So why might you want to use aerial results like SA instead of 2D results? So one is aerial results give you much more information about the surface. As you look at the profile lines on the bottom of the plot, it's kind of hard to get an idea as to what the surface really is like. Versus with a 3D map, you can get a much better uh, image or picture of what it looks like, but that more information also leads to better metrology. So having more information allows you to have a more repeatable and more reproducible result within a single measurement. Uh, because you're capturing so much more information to begin with. So finally, it's also, uh, for the most part, non-directional. So it doesn't matter 
which way you measure the part, whether you're going against the grain or with the grain of the texture, because you're measuring 3D, so you're capturing all of it anyways. So now to get into some of the results of the case study. So first let's look at the parts from vendor A, which was the original uh, or current supplier. So with sample one, it failed the laser power output. And when we take the measurement and look at the average roughness, we can see that it's significantly higher than the one and a half angstrom expected surface roughness. It's up at about three angstroms. Uh, now, when we also look at part four, we can see that it passed the laser output and the average roughness is down about 1.3 angstroms, which is within the specification that they would expect. Now, as we look at um, from the new supplier, which was sample two and sample three, uh, sample two did pass the laser output test without any issues, and the average roughness is well within spec, so we would expect that. So now, as we look at part three, it did pass the laser output spec, but it failed the visual uh, quality control check. And when we take the measurement and we see, okay, well, the average roughness is well below the angstrom and a half spec. But the repeatability where we have a 0.13 angstrom's uh, standard deviation is relatively high relative to the result. So there's quite a bit of variation in the measurements. So now we're going to take a deeper dive into samples one and three to see what may have been go going on with those samples. So let's start out looking at sample one. So when we measured sample one, on the uh, substrate of the sample, it had a fairly high roughness at about 3.1 angstroms. So for comparison, we went to sample two, which was from the same vendor, but measured the uncoated side to see what that was like. And we noticed that it looked quite similar and also was quantitatively quite similar too. It had an average rough, roughness of about 2.9 angstroms. So this raised a red flag as to what might be going on. So we decided to continue investigating and looking into some other things that might be going on with sample one. So now we're gonna look at, particularly for sample one, the substrate versus the uncoated side. And when we look at the uncoated side of sample one, we notice that the average roughness is down around 0.69 angstroms, which is exactly what we would have expected uh, if it was a good sample. So this led us to realize that it was the uncoated side of the mirror was actually intended to be the substrate and the wrong side of the sample was actually coded. So now to take a look at sample three, which was the sample which had a high amount of variation within the average roughness results. So when we took these measurements, we took 16 measurements across the sample to be able to see the variation. So we looked at each of those 16 measurements individually to see visually what may have been going on with those measurements. When we did this, we noticed there was some potential defects in the surface, uh, whether it be a coating issue where there may have been some fluid residue uh, causing some defects or potentially even just handling errors. So now for a summary of the results uh, from all of our measurements. So for sample one, which was the current vendor, it failed the power output as well as some of the QC checks. And we could see that the average roughness was significantly higher than the specification, uh, causing the scatter and thus the lower uh, power output. Sample two was from the prospective vendor and it easily passed both quality control checks. And we can easily see that uh, it had a uh, very smooth surface down around 0.6 angstroms and also very repeatable or consistent. Sample three was also from the prospective vendor and it passed the power output, but failed the visual. And we can see that there were some inconsistencies across the surface by the higher standard deviation, uh, which were led to some of the uh, finding of the coding defects. So finally, sample four, uh, it easily passed the uh, quality control checks and the surface was well within specification. So in conclusion, uh, we realized that the current angstrom and a half specification is probably sufficient to be able to tell a good part from a bad part in most cases, but then also taking it a step further and looking at some of the statistics from measuring multiple areas and seeing how consistent it is. This allows you to see if there's uh, variation across the surface that may help uh, 
find some potential defects that might not have been captured just by a single measurement. So after we went through and created the full kind of metrology solution as to what's going on, what the specifications need to be, and kind of the more quantitative things, we then needed to take all this information and turn it into a production application so any basic operator could run these parts. So to do this, we use Zygo's uh, custom workspace utility within the MX software to create a very simplified interface that has just the information that the operator needs to see and without any other distractions. So the results are clear and easy to understand for the operators. So to wrap up, uh, Smart PSI is used when you're going to be measure any sample that has a sub angstrom type surface because it's going to be an inherently no, low noise measurement technique and allow you to really get that precision that you need. So our 3D optical surface profilers with Smart PSI are great for diagnosing and figuring out some, some of your criti critical uh, production issues, but you can then take that information that you learned in that tool and then move it into a production environment to do some process monitoring as well. So it's not just a lab tool anymore. So now we're gonna open up to some Q&A. So Rich and Dan have been monitoring your questions throughout the webinar. And now Rich is going to uh, read off some of those questions that we'll answer live right now. Uh, if we don't get to any of those questions or some of those questions, we'll make sure to follow up with you after this. So Rich, what questions do we have so far? Yeah, we got some good questions here. The first one that's coming in is, what is the smoothest surface you can measure using this technique? So the smoothest surface that you can measure is gonna be heavily dependent on your environment. So to get down to the sub angstrom type measurements, you're really gonna be limited to how much noise you have and how much you can eliminate. So the more noise that you, the more sources of noise that you can eliminate, the lower you're gonna be able to go from a roughness standpoint. So even though we're at 0.6 angstroms, you could go below that with a significantly better environment. Okay. Next question here. Um, what is the steepest angle that you can characterize? So the steepest angle is gonna be dependent on which objective you use. So as you go to higher magnification objectives, you're generally gonna to go to a higher numerical aperture, which is gonna allow you to measure steeper surfaces. So if we go up to something, say like 100X objective, we've been able to measure surfaces as steep as about 70 to 75 degrees. Okay, next question. Can we use Smart PSI on a new view 8000? Uh, so, uh, Smart PSI, I believe, is available on the New View 8000. Uh, it may require a software update, though. Next question here. Uh, we talked about mirror coatings in this presentation. Can you measure uh, thin film, and especially two dimensional thin film? You can measure uh, thin films with the New View. With the New View, you're going to be able to measure films between generally one micron up to about 100 or so microns. If you need to go to thinner films than that, then the next view is able to measure films down to about 50 nanometers. And here's the next question. You mentioned, I think you've addressed this, but in the <clears throat> slides, you mentioned this was fast. How many uh, seconds did it take for each measurement? So in this case, each of those measurements took about three seconds to do. Uh, so it is pretty quick to measure a single site, and then you can just measure more sites as needed. Okay. Bring a few more questions come in here. Okay. Uh, next question, how large of an area can you stitch? So the area that you can stitch is going to be dependent on a couple factors. Uh, so one is which objective you're using. So if you're using a much lower magnification objective, you can then stitch a much bigger area uh, because in, for the most part, you're gonna be limited just by the memory of the PC. So you're gonna be limited to 
uh, the number of any single field of view that you're going to stitch together. Uh, so we've stitched um, areas up to easily eight or so inches at pretty low magnification. But if you're at, say, 100x objective, you're going to be measuring a bit smaller than that. And what type of vibration isolation is required? Is this possible on a shop floor environment? So it can be possible on a shop floor environment. So there is an air table built into the new view itself. So that, that is there to minimize a lot of the impacts of the localized environment. But if it is a much noisy environment, you're still gonna have some, some vibration that might come from say acoustics as well. Okay. Next question. What if the sample has uh, different materials? Can the program compensate for phase retardation from the material? Uh, yes. So you can account for that if you use the next view uh, with the advanced model based films analysis. So that will allow you to input what materials you're working with and it will properly adjust for uh, those offsets that you might see. Okay, I think uh, I think that's good for the questions. We have a lot more questions here uh, okay. that we can follow up offline. Sounds good. Thank you, Rich. So we will uh, take note of all those questions that you submitted and follow up with you after the webinar. So just wanted to give you some information on what we have coming up. So we're going to be continuing with these pretty much every other week webinars with a few different topics going on. Uh, so whether it be talking about vibration robust interferometry, getting into some scripting within MX using uh, the Python language. And then also how you can go from the model to measurement and using that data in your optical design analysis. We're also gonna be starting up weekly training sessions where we're gonna have a live more in-depth how-to type um, session where you can see exactly how to do things um, within either the software or in one of the instruments. And for all of these sessions, you'll be able to register them if you go to the Zygo website and then look at the upcoming event section down at the bottom of the homepage. And that will have all the links to register as we open up registration for each of these events. Uh, so keep an eye out uh, for that, for those coming up as well. So finally, I want to thank everyone for coming today. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. You can either email inquire at zygo.com or go to uh, the Zygo website and then the contact section and, sub and submit a form. Uh, we'll get back to you shortly. So thank you to everyone for attending and I hope everyone is staying safe and have a great day.